We are uh, starting up the second panel. So after that first panel that got us thinking about life behind the curtain and how to get good ideas through, things to do and things not to do. This panel is all about uh, what is the role played in getting good policy ideas, creating good policy ideas and getting those good policy ideas implemented. What is the role played, if any, by schools of public policy? Says the head of Max Bell. By, well, I'm just trying to be neutral. What is the role played by schools of public policy and think tanks? And so we've got some great people here who come from the worlds of public policy schools and think tanks. Let me just introduce the moderator again, and he will introduce the panel. The moderator is Daniel Belland, and he is a, new, a newcomer this calendar year to McGill. He's a James McGill professor in the Department of Political Science, uh, but he's also the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. He's also an associate member of the Institute for Health and Social Policy, and he's an associate member of the Max Bell School of Public Policy. So he, uh, he has been around the world of think tanks and policy schools and thinking about policy for a long time, and a perfect person to moderate this panel. So Daniel, take it over. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Bienvenue à Montréal. Welcome to the jungle, the policy jungle. And we have, I mean, four amazing policy animals here uh, on the panel. I'm paraphrasing Aristotle. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's pretty good. Uh, so we start with uh, Mel Cap, uh, uh, who uh, has held many different positions, was president of uh, IRPP, the Institute for Research on Public Policy. He was clerk of the Privy Council. He was Canada's high commissioner to the the United Kingdom, which will be a really fun post right now with Brexit, I suppose, <laughs> uh, exciting, and Deputy Minister of en Environment Canada. Then, uh, further to me, we have uh, Marta uh, Hall Finlay, who uh, is the President and CEO of uh, Canada West Foundation. I forgot to mention that Mel currently is professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. I don't like to mention competition, but we'll do that <laughs> an exam, you know, just for this time, an exception. Um, so as for, so Marta Han Finlay, uh, as a corporate lawyer, a, s a s senior business executive and successful entrepreneur, Marta has more than 25 years of domestic and international experience with major multinationals as well as startups primarily in telecommunications and technology. Wonderful. And then, and member of Jack Mintz, who is President's Fellow at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. So more competition here. Uh, and, and Jack's research is focused on tax, urban and financial market, uh, regulatory policy programs. He has published widely in the fields of public economics and fiscal federalism, been an advisor to governments, throughout the world on fiscal matters and has frequently published articles in national newspapers and magazines. And he was the founding director of the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. And then, farther from me. Uh, on, the, on the far left. On the far left and also <laughs> the f farthest west geographically, uh, Nancy Allweller, who is an economist and professor at the School of Public Policy, Simon Fraser University. Nancy's areas of research include natural resource and environmental economics and policy. She was formerly a professor in economics, uh, a professor in the economics department at Queen's University in central Canada, or is it eastern Canada? It depends where you're from, I suppose. The I'll use that language. Canada, right, so we were so asked two Canada. questions, <laughs> two questions, um, and the first question, what is one thing that policy schools and or think tanks uh, are doing well to help in the development and adaptation or adoption of good public policy? And then second question, what is one thing that policy schools and or think tanks should do better promoting good uh, public policy? And we'll actually have uh, introductory statements that will focus on the first question, so to put a positive spin on the panel, what they are doing well. So Mel, we'll start with you. Merci, Daniel. Um, so when I was High Commissioner in the United Kingdom, when I was leaving High Commissioner in the United Kingdom to come to be President of uh, IRPP, uh, the, I was then also Chairman of the Canadian Foundation for the Study of Canada in the United Kingdom. And the group gave me a book 
uh, as a departing gift, and it was Don Abelson, who was at Qu uh, Western at the time, now at uh, SF uh, St. Francis Xavier, uh, basically gave me a, they gave me his book, which was titled, Do Think Tanks Matter? Mm -hmm. And when they gave it to me, they said, you know, Rommel in North Africa had an answer to that question. He said, I think tanks matter. <laughs> My answer is they do matter, and they matter a lot. And if you misheard the panel previously, you would have thought that policy is a, a content-free zone. You would think that it's all about communication, it's all about how you present your ideas, it's not about the ideas themselves. And I think, and I know the people who were here, and I know they didn't mean that, uh, I think you have to recognize that what they were really saying was that the ideas matter. And so this isn't about policy-based evidence. One of my favorite New Yorker cartoons shows a guy behind a desk handing a, a sheet of paper to his uh, underling saying, here's the policy conclusion, go find some evidence to base it on. <laughs> That's not what this is about. It's about doing the research, doing the analysis, and what think tanks and public policy schools do is inform the debate with substance. Good. Marta? Uh, to be fair to the other panel, I would say the message is ideas matter, but they don't do a whole lot of good if they're not implemented. And I think that's the key. If, if, so just, Daniel, merci beaucoup, but um, he talked about my business background. I'm actually here because of my policy work. Um, and I was, thanks to Jack, an executive fellow at the School of Public Policy in Calgary for five mm -hmm. years, and now uh, work at the Canada West Foundation. But I did spend some time in politics, <laughs> and I have a few scars on my back for having been one of the main proponents, or one of the people involved in promoting what was then called the Green Shift. And the Green Shift was a then liberal uh, policy for carbon pricing. And it came because of a seminal paper by Jack Mintz and Nancy Olaweiler that was absolutely fantastic. And so I just thought I would put into perspective some of the, the um, uh, maybe the background for some of what I'm going to say. So the question is, what do you think tanks do well? Um, and, and in our instructions, it was one was development and the other one was adoption. And that goes to good ideas are critical, but they're not really much good, as, as, as Ken said. Um, a good policy, if it's not communicated uh, well, is bad policy. I, I phrase it a little bit differently and say, you can't actually solve a problem that people don't know they have. And I think that was a big problem with the green shift. Um, Yes, communication, but it was also a problem of people not realizing that they had a, 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 a problem in the first place. And I would go to the policies in the early 90s through the 1990s of cutting back on spending, uh, at finally achieving a surplus and paying down debt. That only happened because over a long period of time and discussion, Canadians finally understood that you just can't continue with a massive debt to GDP ratio. And so there was a, a, a general consensus. Um, I think think tanks uh, do do one thing really well, and, I, and I, in the context of media challenges, funding for media, there is very little really good research being out there. Don't take the academics in the room. Don't don't take that the wrong way. But very little real immediate daily, uh, weekly, monthly. Where where are the big issues, and what are the issues and the ideas and the proposed policies? Think tanks, I think, are critical for that. And I think they do, I, you know, I might be biased, but I think we actually do a really, really good job on some of those things. What we're, that's the development piece. The adoption piece I find way more problematic because some think tanks are really, really good at it and some think tanks not so much. And what I've seen over the years is that the think tanks that tend to be really good at it are the ones who do actually play on emotion, the ones who are very well funded for specific purposes. Um, so right now we have a, a, a significant number of environmental uh, NGOs, think tanks, that have been really, really, really good at, adopt, at having a lot of their policies adopted, sometimes for good, sometimes frankly 
on, on a little bit of an extreme perspective, and I, I'm an environmentalist, don't take that the wrong way, but I'm just, I'm talking as a, as a policy think tank person right now. Um, and what I do worry about, and so this is my caveat, um, when we talk about evidence-based public policy, we talk about thorough research, we talk, talk about thorough analysis, my, what I'm seeing is that the moderate voices, the, well, there's a good point here and there's a good point here, how do we actually come to a conclusion to Ken's point and, and to Velma's you know, debate? Um, that's critically important, <laughs> respectful debate is critically important in my shop. We have people, I'm pretty sure every political party gets votes from our shop, which I think is really <laughs> good because we all keep each other honest, but our product, we try extremely hard to make sure it's evidence-based, thoughtful. Those voices aren't necessarily the ones that get heard. They're not necessarily the ones that people in political office right now want to hear. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. That's a, that's a caution and a concern that I have. Thank you. Jack? Uh, well, thank you. I, I think a number of things that were previously said by Mel and Martha I would agree with, especially Martha's comment on our paper that Nancy and I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, let me kind of take a bit of a different uh, tack. Uh, first of all, uh, I have had the privilege of running both a think tank and a school of public policy. Uh, the think tank being the C.D. Howe Institute and then the think tank and the policy school being University of Calgary. And before I started the School of Public Policy, I decided that I did not want to create the typical School of Public Policy. And the reason for that is that I do value very much the importance of academic research. Uh, somebody has to do it. I also support very much uh, the fact that academics will get up and maybe talk about principles that are very important for economists, for example, efficiency, equity, et cetera, in terms of approaching public policy. I think. I think it's very important for people to provide that kind of background in the public policy process because if they, if they don't, then nobody does. And so I think it's really critical that, that academics do put those points of view across. What I think the universities have particularly as a challenge compared to a think tank that's funded uh, privately and doesn't have to work in a university milieu is, is that uh, they need to have a place where they could get ideas out. So what I decided to do with the School of Public Policy, which was quite unusual at that time, was to really create both a think tank and a School of Public Policy. We would have an outstanding Master of Public Policy uh, program. In fact, we were able to attract students right across the country in the very first year. 40% came from Ontario, in fact. Um, and we, we did that because we were out there uh, with publications and, and the sort of things that many think tanks do. The difficulty though when you're doing it at the School of Public Policy as opposed to a think tank like the C.D. Howe or IRPP or, or, the or, West or Canada West Foundation, <laughs> whatever, uh, is that, is that um, down, we, down. The, the real brand I think of the School of Public Policy is academic uh, freedom or the ability of academics to express themselves. We're not concerned about having a particular brand, or I think a school of public policy should not. Their brand should be academic freedom and having the ability to publish things. In fact, we sometimes publish stuff that was directly in contradiction to each other. I didn't care. As long as it went through the peer review process, we had blind refereeing. We always picked referees that the authors had no knowledge who they were. Uh, and we tend to get people from around the world or even in Canada, the very top people to referee. But that was a way of making sure we had good quality control that sometimes think tanks don't do very well. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I think that's a really critical point as, as well. But, I, but there is one issue that I think is, uh, is difficult that if, uh, with the School of Public Policy is that you know, academic um, quality is very critical, I think, to any university. And so the publications that come out from the school uh, have, has to have that kind of quality. Uh, but what really works best among journals is the fact that there's independent editorial review. And, and that's something that a lot of think tanks don't do. Mm. And, and so I think it's very, it, that's really the bridge, I think, that a school of public policy could do. And in fact, something like Max Bell, which I can see Chris is following the sort of things we did in Calgary, and, and some of the other schools are now doing, is really trying to connect the academic community to the whole policy process. And I think that's what needs to be done, and that's the role of the School of Public Policy itself at a university. Jack, we only copy the best. 
at McGill, <laughs> just so that you know. At Nancy? Well, wait, 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 who's the best Jack? We were before you were, so. Uh, what, uh, what school was that? that? that I that's forget on the, name. the left coast. <laughs> uh, but we did create the School of Public Policy. I've been the director of the School of Public Policy for now 13 years because, I don't know, I guess I have no other thing I can do well. But, Irreplaceable. Uh, it's, it, we created it for some of the reasons that have been going on in, in the discussion. And that is, in answering the question of how do academics get their, their good ideas out there, you need a vehicle. And you need a vehicle through an institutional mechanism that does things like this conference. You need a vehicle that allows academics to participate in the public policy process without getting their promotion affected because they're not publishing in journals that three people read. So what we did, and I mean, we all know in the academic world what we're talking about. What we did is create a school that had a combination of strong academic credentials with policy practitioners. And what I want to say about the role of, of public policy schools is it is that opportunity to bring those people together. And now some of it are lucky when we get the, the Jacks and the Mel's and, and even the Chris's that are um, <laughs> <laughs> that are both, that are both, that have strong credentials in both worlds. But it's the juxtaposition of policy practitioners. Like, like Mel, we have in our school, we have former deputy ministers, we have former ministers, and that allows that transfer that people were talking about in the tension. It allows good academic research, good evidence-based policy research to get out into the, to the mainstream. So whether it's, and we can give examples later, and I can give lots of examples, those are the things a good policy school does. That's number one. Number two, as I'm looking out at the room here and the people that don't have gray hair are probably students. Uh, they're smiling. You know, so the real thing we do is we create, and it was talked about, I think Velma talked about it, we create the future. We create the future policy analysts, whether you go into government, whether you go into the private sector, whether you go into think tanks, our job is to help you become uh, equipped to deal with these things. And we have passionate people. The creation of policy schools before Jack's and mine and now Chris's and Mel's, I mean, you've got the people here that created policy schools that did not exist in this country 15 years ago. None of us were here. Mm -hmm. And I think that is filling a huge gap and it is looking toward the future. It is providing the kind of training that merges the pragmatic with the theoretical to make change in this world. And I'm very proud of all of us. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Nancy. And it's true that in Canada, we have witnessed over the last 20 years an explosion in, the, in terms of the number of uh, of policy schools, and that's very important to understand that and in terms of think tank too, it's a very dynamic world. So let's move to our second question, the question that Chris gave us. Uh, the, the one thing that policy schools and or think tanks should and, well, must do better in terms of promoting good public policy. So a kind of to-do list, but short one, the, basically the, the one item you think is really pressing something they must do to improve what uh, uh, what the, the, um, they do. Yes. Um, so when I got to IRPP, I, my predecessor was Hugh Siegel. I asked him, Hugh, how would you know if you've been successful? And he gave me an example, and it was the 2005 leaders debate mm -hmm. in, uh, between Paul Martin and Stephen Harper. And he said, Paul Martin cited an IRPP study to justify his uh, policy on health care. But Stephen Harper cited a different IRPP study to justify <laughs> his policy on healthcare. That was a measure of success. And what I, I think think tanks don't do well enough is identify whether, as both Martha and Jack uh, mentioned, they have a point of view. It's not a bad thing, and I'll come back, you know, I'll pick Ken's point. It's not a bad thing to have a point of view. The Frontier Institute and the uh, Fraser Institute play an important role in the political and, and policy life of the country, and so does the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives on the other side. But it's really important that people know they have a point of view. And what I tell my students is you can't tell the players without a program. 
Don't cite all the research of equal value and equal quality if it hasn't been peer reviewed. Because IRPP is very rigorous at this. I mean, the, the um, policy options is not a learned journal, but it's a learned magazine. Nothing has been, um, uh, we have a former editor here, but uh, not, not that everything was uh, peer reviewed, but rather it's people whose research has been peer reviewed. But the, re the actual publication of research from IRPP has been peer reviewed, and that's really important. Very good. Yes. You knew okay. it was coming. You knew I was going <laughs> to take you to task, right? Um, I do not equate ideology with a point of view. Um, we feel really strongly in our shop, the Canada West Foundation, that when we do the research, we build on academic research, we do our own research, we do as much of, of a thorough analysis of, of that that we can. We come out with recommendations and we are really not shy about espousing the adoption of those recommendations. We absolutely have a point of view but we have been very strong supporting a price on carbon and we have been very strong in supporting the infrastructure build that we need including pipelines justified by the research yeah absolutely justified by the research so i just but i just i just want mm. because i my earlier comment about the moderate thoughtful you know we sometimes can get lost in the debate but i do think it's really important that those who have have those recommendations um, as, and you know, lots of people have recommendations that are not based in research, and, and so, exactly. so we really work hard at that. But then the communication is really, really important. And I would say that a part of the recommendation that is really, really valuable, actually, let me back up two seconds because I want to talk about the peer review piece. Um, it's a little bit like Uber and Airbnb, right? Air, Airbnb doesn't have uh, uh, hired inspectors to go and see how many you know, mice there are in a particular location the way the traditional accommodation industry has had to have because of the immediate consumer uh, review. In effect, you, you're getting review right away. And I'm not saying it's perfect. But what we're finding, certainly in the public policy space, is if you write a piece of crap, you're going to hear about it really, really quickly. <laughs> and you're going to hear about it from people who are really smart and thoughtful and capable. So there's an, uh, there's an element now that there might not have been 10 or 15 years ago, not to take away from, from the traditional peer review, which I huge respect. Um, but, but we're actually held to account a little bit more and a little bit more quickly um, nowadays, which I think is really healthy. The, the, the piece about the communication, though, that I think is really important and, and where we have found that we have been really effective on a couple of files, and I, I know we'll talk about a couple of examples, but I'll just, you know, advance warning, I'm, I'm going to talk about C69, the new, the new Impact Assessment Act, um, is by recognizing where it comes from. So every time we came out talking about C69, every report, every op-ed, whatever, we started by saying, we understand where this is coming from. We understand the intentions of the people who are promoting this. We actually agree with a lot of them. Our issue is with the implementation, with the legislation, with the unintended consequences. If we hadn't done that, we would have been written off as being another Western, you know, uh, uh, nut bar, you know, Neanderthal thing. That's unfair, but, but in the public policy world, you have to understand a lot of people actually think in those, way, in those terms. So for us, it was really, really important. We knew we were not going to get listened to unless we actually started with an understanding of what was being attempted. And, you know, I, I go into detail on where I think we actually did have an effect as a result of that. But again, it's hard, but it's something that's a bit new now, and I think it's really important to do. Thank you, Jack. Well, um, <laughs> several things. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, I think with a think tank, having a point of view or a brand is very important. Uh, and, and that's because partly you're trying to get attention to, to the work that you're doing, and I think that's uh, pretty critical. Uh, but also you tend to uh, focus on certain important areas that uh, a think tank wants to engage in. Uh, with. Uh, with a particular point of view. So, for example, uh, fiscal policy, you might take a view about, you know, what is the appropriate type of tax policies one should be doing, how you balance off efficiency and equity. There could be very, quite different points of view given by different think tanks, but your think tank may have 
a particular point of view and you get identified with it, that allows you actually to gain more support. And, uh, and, but the key is the quality of the publications. Uh, and this is where I think is the second point, and that is credibility is really important. Critical. And credibility, and that's why you can't put out a paper that's really wrong. Even though you may get a lot of pushback from the outside, you're harming your credibility if you're putting out bad papers. And so you have to have good papers, in my view, and that's where the refereeing process uh, is extremely important, is to make sure you clean up the errors. I can tell you, even my own papers that I've published over the years between the C.D. Howe and the School of Public Policy, I had very aggressive uh, referees, and I didn't mind. Uh, in fact, I was glad, because they, they made sure that I didn't have any stupid errors in the paper, and it made sure that the quality uh, was there. So uh, it is a very important thing, and it is very important for, for credibility. Uh, in the academic world, you tend to get that with journals, uh, because of the process. And, and I think that's why it's important for a school of public policy to have something as kin to possible uh, to, uh, to that. Uh, the third point I want to make is that uh, uh, I'm a really patient person when it comes to policy, and I'm not of the view that everything right away has to get adopted uh, just because you happen to put out a paper. Uh, we had great success with Martha's paper that she did for the School of Public Policy on, uh, on supply management. Yeah, it really we got, have it. and we still have it. <laughs> Do I think it's a, it, it's a bad paper? It's no, a great paper. because it was a great paper, yeah. and in fact, it'll still be an important paper for many years to come. By the way, there was a lot of great research that went into it, because we had some terrific people to help Martha on that paper at the school and to do that kind of work. And it was very peer reviewed. In fact, I won't tell you who the referees were because I handled it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but they were really good. And I can tell you that. Uh, but I can tell you that that's uh, you know that that's something that's uh, you know uh, critical to do. You know, I put out a, a paper with Phil Bizell on an HST in Alberta. Now, many of you will know that's, you know, the PST <laughs> is called the political suicide tax. I don't care. That's why I don't care. Really we, we provided the most detailed <laughs> revenue neutral proposal that even David Kahn uh, of the Li Alberta Liberal Party used in the last election. Now, he only got 17,000 votes, <laughs> but it was very brave of him, and I know he was trying to separate himself from the Alberta Party. And this, was, this really did allow him to separate from the Alberta party and try to capture that part of the base. But you know, liberal, having the name liberal was very difficult in Alberta these days. So, so but I think uh, the point is that that paper still gets discussion. Will it happen? I don't know. I mean, my view, you know, when I see public policy develop from good ideas, it's kind of like a drip, drip, drip process. And sometimes it just keeps dripping. But other times, all of a sudden you get a swoosh and something that everyone always says, oh, well, politically it's impossible to do, well, actually true. gets done. Yeah. And that will happen as long as the ideas are really well developed and formulated that gives people a model uh, to work with. And when I did the uh, business tax report, which uh, Nancy was on that uh, business tax panel at that time in 1997, we had a number of very important ideas in that Which all report. got implemented. A number of them got implemented, oh. but not our environmental tax. Finally, that later, finally, finally. That later became yeah. the carbon tax paper yeah. that we did later on. Yeah. But, but it was, it was, but it was, but again, those ideas sit there and eventually they can have an impact and they take 10 years. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had a little proposal in, in, the, tech, in the business tax uh, panel to get rid of the withholding tax on arm's length interest. It took 10 years, but it got done, even though the revenue cost was hardly anything. But anyway, that's the size of the point. But it was a very minor thing, but it still took 10 years to get done. But that's the way public policy operates, and you've got to keep repeating the argument over and over again to get things well, done. Legalizing marijuana yeah. has been around mm -hmm. for decades, and finally. And I think that goes back to a comment from in the previous session about policy windows. and that off, you have to be ready when a window opens. Right. That John Kingdom, a political scientist, wrote about that in 1984, but we use this expression right. now in policy circles outside of right. academia. And by the way, that's why communication, yeah. of even ideas that take a long time to get adopted, the communication of that paper is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, to get out uh, so that the broad public uh, will at least understand the paper or the policy makers know that this paper is hanging there. It may take 10, 20 mm -hmm. years before it gets adopted, but the idea got out, but it still has to get communicated well. Absolutely. Nancy, so what can we do to improve so policy what, schools? Uh, just following up on all my colleagues' conversation, um, sometimes you get lucky, and what you're doing mm. is at the right time in the right place. But what I think we could do better is be more strategic. 
We are not strategic enough in the way we, we in academia, and I'm, I'm, I've written papers for think tank, tanks, but my colleagues are think tankers, tankers. Um, but we are not strategic. We write what we want to write because we are academics and we have academic freedom and those of us lucky to have tenure don't get fired for saying things and that's a good thing. But we're not as strategic as we could be. And by strategic I mean having the kind of pooling of the research and be ready because we never know when those windows are open. I'll go back when I, I wanted to critique the previous panel so that I'll deviate and say that you know, academics don't have a role. Think about the free trade debate. We have Dick Lipsy in the audience. Dick has, and, and a number of economists, were writing about the benefits of free trade. It then became reality. But that's because they had the models, they had the analysis, they had the evidence, and Jack just gave the same thing on, on think tanks and Martha's paper on supply management. We have to be strategic. We are not strategic enough. We are not planning. We are using our freedom to do whatever we want rather than thinking where can we have a role. And I think policy schools can have a bigger role in Canadian policy than we have. Maybe it's because we're juniors, we haven't been around long enough, but I think we can do things together. And one of the things which is probably, uh, my VP will kill me for saying this, is we should coordinate more among our schools. Yeah. Because here, here. we can't, we yeah. cannot do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not big enough. We don't have the resources. We can't do everything. We should coordinate more, because you know, Jack's got all this expertise in tax policy. Do I want to replicate Jack? No, that's not. You know, that shouldn't be our comparative advantage. We should be more strategic. That's that's what I think is missing. Policy Daniel, schools I, of Canada unite. Unite. Yeah. Daniel, can I <laughs> just quickly add a point which I forgot to mention, but it's a follow up to Nancy. You know, the, the other very important thing I think about, um, uh, you know, people writing papers, and this is a real challenge with academics, is you, we, whether it's a think tank or a school of public policy putting out the paper, it has to have a point of view, the author has to have a point of view. The school may not have a, right. a point of view itself, or trying to advocate a particular point of view, but the paper has to have a point of view, otherwise it won't be of interest. Mm -hmm. And many academics, are afraid to express a point of view. They like to say, yes. um, you know, there's this argument, there's that conclusions. argument, and come to no conclusion. That will get zero interest. Yes. You have to come to a conclusion, and that's tough for many academics to do. I think it's a good point. I want to mention, going back to the previous panel, because several of you have mentioned that already, and it, it goes back, I think, to the core role of think tanks and policy schools, and the role of academics also within the policy process, is the role of evidence. Uh, we, some people talk about evidence-based uh, evidence policy. I prefer to talk about evidence and foreign policy, perhaps more modest, but still uh, evidence can play a role in, um, in, um, in policy making. So what's your assessment of this issue of the role of evidence in policy making, but also what could uh, think tanks and policy schools do to bring evidence to the table in a constructive manner within the policy making process? So uh, let me build on Nancy's comment about being strategic. Uh, this discussion about windows and patience uh, offends me, frankly, because it makes us sound like we are uh, passive in the process. And you've just, you know, if we could just wait and then pounce. The fact is, you build a consensus, you build the window, you build the opportunities. And if you think about the, uh, uh, what a being strategic means and being active in building that consensus, you use the evidence to build, and, you know, everybody is the parent of a success. So Ken claimed being uh, the parent of the uh, child tax benefit. Uh, I claim to be the owner of that because when I was a deputy at Human Resources Development, uh, the, as it then was, uh, we introduced the national child benefit. And that was a huge, dramatic change. And, uh, and it could not have happened without Fraser Mustard. And the research he did on early childhood development, and it couldn't have happened without Martha Friendly, who was uh, an advocate, who pushed that governments had to do something. And so, it, and we weren't sitting there passively waiting until they were successful. We were helping them, and we were trying to get the research done so that it would inform, I like mm -hmm. your characterization, it would inform the public debate 
and it would inform the political actors that they would have to take action. And I think going back to Kingdom, since we have students of public policy with today's work, he's talking about policy entrepreneurs. And I think exactly. they, they play a role too. They are proactive. They and are he talks about passive. the streams. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I? timing is important, but also you have to be proactive in promoting your ideas. Uh, yes, Jeff? Yeah, or just to uh, follow up on Mel's comment, which I basically agree. Um, there's another part to strategic thinking, and that is um, academics, and this kind of goes back to a comment that Nancy made, academics tend to be supply driven in the sense that, mm -hmm. well, here's my idea, I'd like to kind of get it out type of thing. <laughs> They're not really Demanded. reaching out to hear what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, uh, one of the key things I learned over the years, and I have to admit it started with the C.D. Howe Institute, is that uh, you really have to get out there and talk to people to see what's on the top of their minds and what are the big issues and how you can solve it. In fact, some of the papers I even did myself you know, over the years was over World Bank work. I used to travel a lot of countries doing corporate tax reform. In fact, some of my better theoretical papers actually came out of a problem that I saw that people hadn't analyzed. Like, for example, how do you model investment for a tax holiday firm, things like that. It, it was really interesting. It was very poor research and things like that and gave me a great idea and that sort of thing. So, the, but the key is you really have to get out there and understand what are the issues mm -hmm. and then your papers could be very strategic because you are listening to what the demand side is for, for research. Can I come back to students? Uh, Oh, we'll yes. have to let Martha, no, no, but no, no, I just... No, no, no. Okay, go okay? and after Martha, will be next. Okay. Um, one way we do this, and I, you know, we've been talking about lofty federal big things, but you know, public policy starts everywhere at the ground mm -hmm. level. I mean, the, a lot of public policy that, that filters up comes at the municipal level where the rubber hits the road, where you know, we're dealing with all the same problems. So one of the things we do in our policy school is we embed the students right away in real world problems. They work with external agencies. They work with municipalities, with government ministries, with not-for-profits, with civil society on an issue that they have defined. And the students then, I mean, this is like, you know, welcome to the real world. They find out all the messy details on that and they are immersed right away in that sort of thing. So it's not just writing the academic papers and getting that, that what we've been talking about. It's developing, and that's again why I'm a cheerleader for policy schools, but one of the reasons is, is that we get down to that level. So Jack's comment, which is I wanted to follow Jack about supply versus demand driven. This is demand driven. This is coming at it from, from those levels. So whether it's better health care for indigenous children or it's one of the policy themes was, how do we get a better nightlife policy in Vancouver? Uh, you know, it can be anything uh, to protecting industrial lands from condoization. I mean, these are real world problems. And what I think is missing is getting our faculty engaged in the same sort of things, to, to, to echo Jack's comment is to say, yeah, we have the privilege of working on what we want to work on, but again, I'll come back to strategic. If we follow up these things and we look for the areas that we could provide the evidence and the research and we bring our students in, because man, that's a lot of cheap labor. <laughs> and uh, you know, cheap, high quality labor. We are building it from the ground up. And I think it's just a level of capacity that has to get bigger and bigger. Nancy, if you want to improve the quality of nightlife in Vancouver, just come to Montreal. You can draw policy lessons. Come more often. And, we, and were, we were going to have a field trip, but... Uh, That's amazing. You are we, more than we, welcome. As far as we got was Granville Street, so... Uh, Chris will facilitate that, I'm sure. I was, I was just going to say, some policy Marta? questions are really easy to answer. Come to Montreal. Yeah. It's just, uh, anyway, you stole my thunder. Um, can I, can I once again, I'm, I'm going to do the, I agree with Mel and I agree with Nancy on the patience piece, mm -hmm. even though you said you disagreed with Nancy. So, um, because that's just the kind of person I am. I just, you know, that moderate, thoughtful, bring people together. I'm learning. Um, but it's a really serious point. The patience piece is absolutely critical. But it can't be you're just sitting around waiting. Right. It can't be because patience only works if you're actually working at it the whole way along. So if I look at legalizing marijuana, for example, mm -hmm. The Economist magazine, I think it's 25 years it's been adv advocating legalization of marijuana. Um, interestingly enough, this was one that really wasn't uh, um, uh, partisan. Uh, the Fraser Institute did a, a really good piece quite a long time ago on, the, on why legalization of marijuana is important. 
but then you get to the point where you have a government in place that's actually willing to do it. Then you actually have, you have all of that work. I do hope at some point we will have a government that is, has enough courage to uh, overhaul supply management. But once they do, if and when that happens, they will have a whole lot of really, really, really good work to give them the material with which they can actually do that. And the patients, I go back to how important that working at it and influencing the public opinion and getting people to understand, I go back to the comment, the, the example I gave before was, and one that I think has been critically important in Canadian in, in the last number of decades in Canada, was we were spending like crazy. We were spending like crazy because people were asking for, for spending, right? We were spending like crazy, spending like crazy. Listen, that wasn't partisan. That happened with a, several governments in a row. <laughs> To the point where we were being regarded as kind of the third, one of the third world countries in terms of debt to GDP ratio. And then people started to say, this is a real problem. They said it for quite a long time. That was critical to get the Canadian public to understand, oh, wow, this is a problem. My comment about you can't solve a problem that people don't know they have. Finally, the Canadian public understood that the country had a problem that needed solving. That paved the way for the policies, uh, including the GST, including the, what then when it the, became a Liberal government, the cutting of spending. All of those policies were incredibly important to Canada, and, and you know, one would argue that the, the result of that was that it allowed Canada weather the, the, um, uh, the really difficult times in 2008 forward. So really important policy, really good that we did it. Uh, I make no comment about the current situation, only that that was a key part of allowing the government in, in place at the time to implement the really good policies that were necessary. So it's a, it mm -hmm. is a combination. Of so we can, uh, is there a consensus that it's about being both patient and opportunistic, not in the crass sense of the, the, the word, but being like an entrepreneur and knowing when there is an opportunity to actually you know, be proactive? Yeah, but you have to focus, <coughs> and this goes to the focus, this goes to the, to, and I absolutely, the collaboration, by the way, like think tanks, public policy schools, it's a little bit the problem with universities. You see right now, every uni so many universities are all trying to be everything to everybody. Yeah. I don't think that that's necessarily useful, but I think if we can have, this we're Canada. We don't have a whole lot of think tanks in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. The good news is that few of them are really partisan the way they are in the United States. The opportunity and I think the real need for way more collaboration to say, what are you working on? What are you working on? How can we you know, find it? Um, and I would just say, can I just a shout out? Uh, Alan Northcott runs the Max Bell Foundation. That would be um, how this school came to exist. Huge supporters of Canada West uh, Foundation, big supporters, and the Ivy Foundation too, big supporters of good public policy. We wouldn't be here in this room if it weren't for people who actually felt that that was important. So that money is well, yes. But that, but that funding will be way more effective if it, in, if it gets all, more collaboration, less duplication. Um, I just think there's some real opportunities for that too. Very good. Before we go to the floor, because we'll have, I'm sure, plenty of questions. We have a lot of students in the room. This is the first cohort of Max Bell students, MPP students. And if you have a very, in one or two minutes at the most, 90 seconds, what's the advice you will give to a student who wants to get involved in the policy world and make a difference in terms of uh, promoting or finding evidence to support or not a specific policy ideas? What should they do? How should they think? We start with you, Mel. So I'm torn by uh, encouraging the students to uh, go into the public service of Canada uh, with a and and with a small p and a small s and uh, work in government. Uh, that's what I really deeply believe. Uh, but also to look around and consider think tanks, NGOs. A lot of very good policy research is being done in NGOs now. Uh, private sector, a lot of uh, big companies and medium-sized companies are doing fundamentally good research. So I, I you know, diversify, look uh, across the full spectrum, but don't forget the public service. Marta? Uh, yes, agreed. Um, just because we really need a good, strong public service. 
Um, I would say that some think tanks, I know in our, in our place, we treat our policy analysts a little bit like students. In fact, we basically say, we know, and you should know, that you're not actually going to be with us for, for your, uh, your career. It's really important that you spend time with us. We benefit from your input, but we hope that you benefit from this environment and the lessons about thorough research, the lessons about dealing with media, all of the things that we can do as a think tank. Um, we benefit from that from the folks who work with us, but we also think it's really important that, that they, then, they then take that and, and move on, whether it is to the public service or whatever. So we actually do think we do a public service um, in, in that sense, and we benefit so much from, from that. Um, so absolutely, consider think tanks. Consider, listen, nobody pays a whole lot, just sorry. Um, but it's a great experience, and it's, um, uh, it's really critical for the country that we have people mm -hmm. like all of you who are doing this. You, may, you took the step to, j to join this school, fantastic. Um, really consider how to make what you're passionate about into, in fact, a career, but there's always a few steps that you can benefit from. Jack? Um, well, first of all, uh, students that we've had at the School of Public Policy, about half have gone into the private sector, half have gone into the public sector. Private sector, I'm including NGOs, but uh, a lot of them go into large corporations. What I find very gratifying is how quickly they move up the corporation, partly because they have, I think, three critical skills. And this is what I encourage students most to have. Number one, the ability to communicate, both in orally and writing. Absolutely important. Communication, you have to be able to write and you have to be able to communicate. Secondly, critical thinking. You know, there's nothing worse than everyone saying the same thing. And so, uh, you know, and, and that's the only problem with collaboration is making sure you get enough competitive ideas out there. Oh, that's just, not uh, a problem, Jack. That's not collaboration. <laughs> um, and, and, but, but secondly, but secondly that, but that is very important. Critical thinking is really important. You don't go along with everything necessarily, find out for yourself what you think is correct. But third, and, and, and I see a lot of the schools of public policy, including Nancy's and uh, University of Toronto and us, uh, and I'm sure, I, I don't know the curriculum at Max Bell, but I assume, Chris, you've gone this way as well. But I think it's very important to get certain skills, especially quantitative yeah. skills, and we forget that. You've got to be able to deal with data. You've got to be able yes. to deal with Excel sheets. You've got to be able to deal with, with uh, information like that. I mean, you know, one of the students that I've, we had, at, actually he was a McGill undergraduate, came to us to do his Master of Public Policy in our first year and at Calgary. He's the one that works with me a lot, Phil Bazell. He was a political scientist, but this guy has phenomenal skills in computing and working with large data sets. It's just unbelievable. And I'm glad I have him because I'm totally incompetent in those things. So it, it's, it's uh, but it, those quantitative skills really pay off. And so really encourage you to make sure you get some quantitative skills. And, and being skeptical. Like yeah. really well, that's, the, really that's a critical thinking. That's a critical thinking. Exactly yeah. That's a critical, critical thinking. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Nancy? I have one word. Graduate. <laughs> <laughs> Good Everything advice. else follows. Uh, our students go out and like uh, all the rest of them, they get jobs all over the place. They move up the food chain quickly. And, you know, just to echo what Jack said, and that is, uh, it's not what you know, it's what you know how to do. Mm -hmm. And it's developing those schools. Mm -hmm. we, we spend a lot of time on research methodology rather than content in subject areas. Because mm -hmm. smart people can learn the subject <laughs> readily. And that's, and smart people learn, it well, well-trained people learn to, to know what's important. So we do a lot on research methodology, but we also, following what Jack said, spend a lot of time saying, you know, when you're when you're working for when you were working for Mel in, in the Privy Council, you don't have three years to do a paper. <laughs> this is not a research, you know, you don't have that freedom. He wants it on his desk tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So you also have to learn how to sort through the crud and go to the essence of the problem quickly. And that's what I think policy schools do and do well, is you know, you've got to, you know, you, you don't have the liberty of time. You've got to get to the, to the core issues. And we train them to do that. And we train them to produce it in a way that a very busy decision maker can read it 
they get the idea, they know what your evidence is, they know what your analysis is, and you come up with, you know, whether it's appropriate, you come up with a recommendation. Can That's I, what we do. And I those are the skill sets that no, no, no. transfer no, to okay. any kind of yeah. job. Just, uh, yes. just one thing that you really hit that just struck me, and, and it was when mm -hmm. Jack said the credibility is really important, and it really is, and that you don't wait to put some crap out and get stuff back. You absolutely have to have the discipline before it, because you don't want to get dumped on. All. So you have that internal discipline. But it is brand, and it credibility is key to your brand. That's true for every single one of the students in this program, because if you put out work that is shoddy, you are, you're going to affect your brand. And so that level of discipline is really, really important. So if there was one piece of advice I would give, I give it to our, our, the folks in our shop too, make sure you do really good work. Yeah. It takes, and you know what? It's ours. It takes, a, it takes work and discipline. But that you each, each one of you has a personal brand that you want to make sure is a really good one. So that piece is really important as well. May I, I want to add something? Just, um, I Quickly. did a review for the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario of public policy schools in Ontario. And one policy school that I will remain nameless uh, told me that their brand uh, and what they really sold to incoming students was that they didn't have to do economics. Oh, God. Uh, God. And, <laughs> and, and knowing, oh, knowing the uh, director of the uh, Max Bell School well enough, I'm sure that will not be a failure of this place. But I, I mean, you he do almost need. Had a stroke when you said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You do need to have a good critical analytical, thinking analytical and quantitative analytical. skills, yes. and part of that comes from economics. Here, here. <laughs> Wonderful. So we'll go to uh, the Vox Populi, so the people in the room. And I would like to start with a student, actually, since we're talking about students. So who's a student? You don't have to be a student here or at Max Bell. But, uh, are you a student? Part-time student. OK, well, we'll start with you then. Part-time, OK. We'll give you a part-time answer. Then we'll do a full-time <laughs> Part -time Hi, my name is Omar. Uh, I'm part a uh, part-time student in, in UCAM. Uh, do you think uh, there's a mismatch between the risks due to international turbulences and the public opinion readiness to accept new and maybe not popular policies? And if yes, what would you recommend to increase the awareness about the uh, threats that might come from international uh, environment and affect uh, internal public policies. Thank you. Who wants to take this one? Well, I'll just start by saying uh, I, I teach in the Max, in the Monk School. <laughs> in, the monk, in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And that's my answer. They go together. Um, I, it, th that's actually not a new problem. Um, if I look at the challenge, the never-ending challenge we have with trade policy, um, <laughs> and so you know, international relations, it's all so much is tied to economics. Um, uh, the challenge that we have with trade is that when trade, the, the not everybody wins with trade. Overall, everybody wins, but there are always some more localized losers, and if you have a factory closing down in a town, which happened in the town I used to live in. We had a whole lot of factories close down and go down to, to uh, various southern states, in particular uh, after the initial free trade agreement. Um, that can give the image, and this is communication, this is the story, this is the, the, the tragedy of the little boy on the beach. Those end up affecting policy, and that, and that's the biggest challenge I think we have is to overcome those, to be able to say or use them, to be able to really say this is in fact the right policy for our economy and our, our society as a whole. So it's not an answer, but it's a it's not that it's a new problem. It's a just never. Okay, just quick remarks, and you don't have to very, each very, answer each question, but no, we'll, no, no, for just, this one we we'll have four. Just very quick, the uh, be prepared. Be prepared for the uh, mitigating factors that you need to introduce to address the problems. Every policy, everything will have winners and losers. Yeah. And so if you're prepared with, you know, with mechanisms to deal with that, so if it's free trade, you know, there are the losers. There was the textile industry in Quebec. 
you know, what do we do? So that's where policy can come in again, is to not just look at the, you know, at the, the first wave of the effect, it's to look at the side effects and the, the adverse effects on, on people and their lives. I, I was gonna very quickly say that it's not just globalization, but it's also technology mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is uh, gonna be a very difficult set of issues. In fact, it always has been. Uh, because when you have new technology, we know in the end you do create more jobs. I mean, a lot of studies have shown that. But you do get displacement. And the, and the difficult part is how do you deal with displacement? And to be frank, I, I don't think we've done a very good job as policy analysts in terms of how to figure out how to handle displacement. And, and that applies to globalization, it applies to, in a lot of other things. Uh, but you know, we're all very good at talking about the aggregate gains. Uh, the di more difficult thing is how do you deal with the people that are Sure. affected negatively, and that's not that simple. And frankly, I don't feel that like a lot of policies, we tend to worry as much about that, and that's why you get this populist reaction. Yeah. Thank you, we'll have a question here. Yes. Hi, um, yeah. Hi I'm an undergraduate economics student at McGill, and uh, I uh, was wondering, when you are talking about articulating uh, issues, uh, pioneers that you refer to as role models and um, people in your field when you think about how they got done, what they were getting done, was it, did it tend to be articulating a problem that was omnipresent in a succinct way that represented something that was very observable but articulating it in a special way? Or was it taking a problem that was obscured and shedding light on it? Um, and bringing, so I was wondering, wow. was it mostly that or was it the other part? And w how do academia and think tanks think about these things differently and how do they process putting forward uh, pioneer ideas into action? A great Megill okay, student okay. question. That's a great question. <laughs> so who wants to uh, answer? Uh, well, okay, I'll start just because uh, uh, I was, in, in a sense, it's kind of, uh, both, you know, when I look at past models, and by the way, Dick, Dick Lipsy, who's here today, which I'm really glad to see Dick, uh, taught me <laughs> macroeconomics, which I never really enjoyed very much, but, <laughs> uh, but taught me or, macro or understood. in my master's. <laughs> no, I understood it. That was the problem. But anyway. Um, Just kidding, Jack. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, the thing I, I always admired about Dick was that ability to not only pick a problem, articulate uh, a, a thinking through modeling and its implications, uh, but then being able to actually sell it to a large uh, group as he did through the CD Howe and on trade policy. And so uh, those kinds of people I always admired in being able to bridge uh, the, those two things. Now, I did have some people that I also admired very much, like Dan Usher, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was a, a wonderful micro-theorist. Maybe that's why I liked him so much. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he, um, he also knew how to articulate a very strong point of view. And he wasn't into the game of trying to sell his points of view in a, in a, in a political way, uh, but he did have a significant influence on many people in terms of how they thought about some issues, and I think that uh, is a different type of model, which sort of suggests there are various models to, to follow. Some people are good at combining things. Others do specialize in other things, but I think what you do most comfortably is probably where you should be. We'll just take another, we have a lot of questions here. We'll, uh, well, uh, we'll just move a bit. Okay, we'll go at the far end there. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll move back that way. And we'll try to have one person answering one question so that we can take as many questions as we can. Hi guys. Um, first of all, thank you so much for um, your insightful opinions and thoughts on progression of the, I guess, the want to be public servant. Um, I actually come from a space in between uh, graduate school and, and my undergraduate. I've been working for the Ontario government for the last two years now. Um, and I've sort of worked my way with a lot of self-learning, um, being a part of the policy innovation hub in Ontario. And I've come at a point where I'm sort of looking at options for my um, graduate school studies. 
And based on... Uh, excuse me, yeah. not, not, don't look there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I've been going we're around... We're a lot cheaper. We're, we're <laughs> cheap, we're very cheap. And um, I'm also sort of like, I'm also, I'm here as a student because I'm also trying to learn French at UFT School of Continuing Studies, which is also my alma, alma mater back in Toronto. Um, I, I heard some really insightful thoughts on think tanks and other, I guess, me mechanisms and machinery that run public policy and governments. And I've had the pleasure of sort of seeing it closely in my earlier roles. But one of the questions I had was the role of consultants. And when I say consultants, I mean corporate consultants in policy making. Because one of the things that I do in my job is to turn tr long, boring treasury board submissions into pictures and videos and thoughts and images that the common public or the minister's office or deputy minister's office can understand because sometimes I think it's easier to see a 10 slide presentation than go over a 52 page treasury board submission. What's your but question? The question is oftentimes um, most of these opinions are informed by hired consultants and we see year after year of government spending so much money on bringing in Deloitte, bringing in KPMG. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on where they place and when would be the time where we we all sit together, including them, at tables, which inform better public policy making. Thank you. Thank you. Consultants. Um, bane of our existence. Um, we do a hell of a lot of work that ends up getting used by consultants, only they get paid a ridiculous amount of money and we operate on a shoestring budget, um, often regarded as a free good. Consultants <laughs> are a challenge and ultimately credibility is key. We yeah. do a ton of really good work that gets used. But if we ever cross over that line into doing a report that serves a particular client, we're not doing our job, and frankly, we're not doing their job. I've seen a lot of consultant work. I'm not talking about GR and PR. I'm talking about consultants that know where their bread is buttered and do work that is not as good as what can be obtained elsewhere. And it's a shame because yeah. there's a ridiculous amount of money. I'd love anybody who works in a corporation or in a, in a government in this room, um, uh, public policy schools and, and good public policy think tanks are really great sources of great work, and we're not going to. We're good because we're not going to. We're not going to, you know, blow up your skirt, right? Um, and so I just, bit of an issue for me. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Okay, we'll take another question. No prelude, just the question directly. Yes. Um, I was. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Thinking about policies that affect children, um, there was a comment in the in the last panel about uh, children are, are, are not votes, and that really affects, uh, that hit me uh, quite close to my heart. I work in child welfare policy, I'm also a social worker, so I see both sides. And I, I really struggle with the slowness, we were talking about patients, and then I heard a little bit talking about moving things along. It's really hard to sit and see children being affected by the slowness of policy changes, specifically with First Nations, Indigenous, and Inuit children. And I'm really wondering what we can do as academics if we're, you know, whether it's uh, partnering with public policy schools to help us, you know, we have advocates, people like Cindy Blackstock, she can't even get things moving along. What do we do? How do we get this when we have the data, we have the evidence, we have everything we need to move this policy, and there's just even apparently political will, yet it's still stuck, it's still stuck. So I'm just wondering if someone can speak to you. Who wants to take that one? Well, I mean, we, I, I thank you for your question and I really appreciate your frustration, particularly for somebody who sees it on the front line, because you see it every day. So, you know, this is an area where I'll use it as an example where we could be more strategic, where we could pool our resources. One of the problems we have in this country is we're a big, pro, a big country with not enough capacity. So if we pool our resources, we work with organizations like the First Nations Health Authority in BC. Our students do projects for them. They're working on those sorts of things. We have faculty working for them, but there's not enough of us. We need more of us and we need a more of a, I'll come back to my strategic issue. This is, this is a, a very serious public policy issue that needs more attention. And somehow we've got to garner the resources to do it. I mean, and, and I'm sure my colleagues, you know, there are people working on, on these parts all over the country, but they're not coming together. 
and we need to come together. And again, that's how we've got some of these other things done. You know, the free trade, I keep coming back to that. That was good analytical work where people came out. It was, it was C.D. Howe, it was the old Economic Council of Canada. It was, you know, people, you know, pulling together and it got that highlighted and moved up the agenda. And that's what we've got to do. Jack, just 20 seconds. Yeah, 20 seconds. If I was giving a student a project to do in this area, which I think you've identified an interesting problem, the first question I would say is try to figure out what are the obstacles of why those policies are not moving? And then how can you get over those obstacles? That's the way you approach the problem. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yes, we have a question here. My name is Stephen Davis. I'm a retired professor of philosophy. I take it the uh, conclusions of the social sciences, if they're evidence-based, is what is the case, or perhaps what was the case, or what will be the case, but it doesn't tell us what ought to be the case. Mm. I take it the public policy's conclusions is about what ought to be the case. So there's a gap between what is the case and what ought to be the case. So the question I have for you is, how do you bridge that gap? How much study goes into points of view, as you put it, or into ideologies, that is, into values? As you well know, there's an enormous amount of work for centuries that has been done on values. But I don't see anybody in this conference that is bringing values to the table from a <coughs> academic point of view. So the question is, how much do your public schools of public policy invest in having your students study value theory or your foundations so, promote research in value theory? Perhaps you so, do, but uh, I'd like to hear about it. Thank that. you. Ma we, um, so first of all, the normative question is something that all of us have been talking about, but we haven't called it that. Uh, but we've all been talking about what we should be doing. Uh, in our program, I don't know about Max Bell, but at uh, Monk, uh, all, a compulsory program is on ethics. And in that, uh, actually a professor of law and or a professor of philosophy teaches the course. As much as I like economists, uh, we do look to uh, philosophers no from time to time. <laughs> uh, so it, but it's an integral part of our program, and we think it's an essential requirement, and therefore it's a compulsory course. Anything to add? Uh, yeah, Mark? I mean, I mean, and I, I just, I don't think it's a, it, it, it has to be a separate thing. I mean, every day we talk okay. about values of integrity. We, we, we it, do our best to enforce values of, of honesty, of, uh, thorough, thorough work of, of that in, sen in sense of that work ethic, and our whole purpose for being as a as an organization is to maximize the economic and social prosperity of people in Western Canada and by extension Canada. Um, that's a pretty strong value, and then you take that as a basic thing, and then you drill down and you say, well, how do, how does equality of opportunity fit into that? What does that do? We have three centers. We have trade, natural resources, human capital. How, what does that mean to our work in um, in uh, in uh, competencies and how we make sure that there's a, a greater equality of opportunity? I mean, I don't think those are partisan things, but they are actually pretty important mm -hmm. values. We don't just set it aside and say, oh, here, here's your, here's, you know, we need to talk about ethics today. I, I, I like to think that our work and what we choose as projects to work on and how we do that work is actually that's something we, we live every day. And I don't mean to diminish the question, but I, it's something that's actually really important to us. My second favorite New Yorker cartoon is when the guy having the meeting says, okay, honesty is the best policy. That's option A. <laughs> <laughs> so, wonderful panel. We are out of time. And as we say to paraphrase a famous song, there is no business like policy business. Uh, so thank you uh, very much uh, to our uh, panelists. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your questions. Thank you, Dennis.